5.36 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, January 28th, 2022 years. If I had to guess, I would say it's closer to 2022 years from the foundations of Israel between Mitzrayim and Canaan than 2022 years from the life of Christ, if I had to guess. So today, uh, I'm doing what I can to uh, guarantee that I have even less friends than I already do. But if I was in this to make friends, I certainly wouldn't have gotten as far as I have because I would keep not saying certain things and not bringing up certain things because they're not popular with virtually every circle out there. Which is why, um, for one thing, I commended the, the few, um, the few content creators who shared bringing it all together. One of the most noteworthy is Jim Rizzoli because of just how many subscribers he has on his bit shoot and world truth videos. Um, Gottmitz Unz also did. Um, he goes by, I think, Gottmitz Unz 1984 on world truth videos. Um, some of these guys have to have different names uh, on different platforms because sometimes their names, I mean, you know, Gottmitz Unz, uh, you know, God with us is something that's going to be taken up probably, you know, pretty commonly, maybe before you get to it. So, but, and then there's one other content creator that shared it, uh, that, that full video on world truth videos. So you can find it because I don't have an account yet on world truth videos. I've tried uploading uh, a few videos in the past and uh, I keep getting blocked uh, citing that it's, the file size is too large, and most of the file size that I try to make are pretty compressed. There's, There are only some situations where I just will not compress something past a certain point. But As most of you know who've followed the work that I've done for years now, you'll know that the way that I tend to work is... I will give bits and pieces, I will theorize, um, whenever I hear something, see something that strikes me as odd and noteworthy, I'll either mention it in the context of something else that I'm doing, like the Obrey Hours or something like that, which... Um, it could be a little while before I do another one of those because um, I'm trying to develop um, some much more powerful documents uh, for actual word searching with Hebrew and Strong's and the King James translations, and hopefully I'll be able to do it. But in the meantime, so that's that's what I do. Um, when for months and months before I made the presentation, bringing it all together, I, I was making posts and putting a lot of posts up on social media and on my YouTube channel concerning, you know, Prester John, uh, Yun, um, the, this kingdom in the East, and so on and so forth, before I could start putting things together. So the other day, I listened to, it was a two-part presentation that a woman who went by uh, the pen name, if you want to call it that, Sencha McRae. I haven't heard from Sencha, but nothing out there, no material from her in a, a couple of years. I think the last thing I saw from her was... She was involved with Renegade Tribune, and her last post might have been around 2019. I haven't heard anything from her. 
of course she has no YouTube channel and if you start listening to her material you'll find out why I have downloaded all the material that I could get my hands on from her because I know it's going to continually be targeted there's one video that I think is an, a very important video that I can't find a copy of anywhere if anyone out there is familiar with Sencha McRae and you've downloaded her material in the past and you have it archived I would greatly appreciate the um, the presentation she did called the shadowy world of the Templars because I can't get it anywhere it's not there's a um, a bit shoot site that's called um, untold tales like unofficial mirror but that's besides for some of her pieces here and there that you might find on on different platforms that's about the only thing that I've found that has all of her work together in pretty much one place but that file will not load and if you go to renegade who still has her presentations up the file is missing there and of course her website she had a website uh, untold tales for a long time of course that website doesn't exist anymore and that's that's really sad because you know besides for some disagreements that I had with her concerning some of her um, I guess just her beliefs based on all of the knowledge that she had gained from all of her reading and studying that she'd done over the years um, I had my own knowledge base and we disagreed not formally uh, and t to be honest I was going to make a series of videos on people who were like sort of in various uh, like white nationalist kind of movements and um, the, the perspectives that they had that I thought were very detrimental to to actually a, um, a productive move towards a, a good uh, restart of this corrupt world and you have to know this world is so corrupt top to bottom left to right it is so saturated with corruption and lawlessness from from the top levels the, the shadowy people hiding and and sending in proxy armies to do their bidding those uh, people I referred to uh, in my last video as faggots because they are they don't a man if you look into history a man let's say a king or a warlord whomever that had the um, the desire to take something of another people they would come with their army or they would send their emissary directly to that people and tell them here's what's going to happen you know if if they needed wealth they might tell them you can pay me this or I will come down upon you or they might just want that land that territory those resources and just say get ready we're coming but they were men if they were going to forcibly take something from somebody else they did as men do they told them directly we have every intention of taking this thing from you whether by way of tribute or by occupation or we're just going to come in and wipe everyone out and we are going to adopt this as our new homeland they didn't hide in the shadows and buy up like all right give you a perfect example one of the the first big um, one of the really first big issues that the kingdom that carried away uh, the majority of the northern kingdom called the house of Israel and who carried away a good chunk of the southern kingdom called the house of Judah and nearly would have destroyed Jerusalem Jerusalem if it hadn't been for Yahweh interceding and killing 185,000 185,000 men of Ashur Assyria they would have succeeded 
this one. All right, the first big one, because before then, Israel and Judah had, they'd had a lot of wars, battles, problems with various neighbors. You had a ram uh, sorted to the north, northeast. You had Moab and Amun over, <coughs> I don't want to say east, it should be northwest, so over to the west. You had Adum to the south, and you had uh, others. You had Hamat, you had um, the kingdom of Tzur, which would have been um, um, Tzidun, that an area. You had Mitzram, and of course you had the Palashatim, Philistines. Let's see, all around them. But the first big one was Assyria. And now, when Assyria came to Jerusalem, we don't know as much about how they communicated with uh, the northern kingdom, but we can assume that it would have been in a very similar, straightforward way. Sennacherib sends his emissary to Jerusalem to tell them what's going to happen, what Sennacherib's intentions are. And he doesn't want to have a private meeting with the king, um, which I'm sure the king and the nobles and all of the people who enjoyed living off the backs of the people then, because yes, Judah's government and Israel's government did that same sort of thing. Again, it was open in the sense that you're going to be taxed and the tax is going to be taken, but we're going to be spending it on this and this and this. And then they oftentimes would spend it more on themselves and their lavish lifestyle and their wives and their things and their summer houses and their winter houses and things like that. They did not want the people or their military. In this case, it would have, it was Hezekiah, who was the king at the time. Um, they didn't want their their people, their military, to really understand what the uh, the stakes were. So when Sennacherib's emissary comes, he's speaking plainly in Obri, which at that time would have been called like Lashun Yuda, uh, uh, the, the tongue of Judah, which was Obri. Um, he's speaking in that language to the men who are the guards at this, wherever it was that he was, uh, uh, you know, sort of a main entry where th these men, probably heads or captains of guards, were there and could hear him. He wanted them to hear him. He did not want to speak secretly with uh, the king or the king's uh, representative. He wanted these men to know what the stakes were. This is how straightforward a guy like Sennacherib was. Uh, uh, oftentimes, the Ashur or of Ashur, Ashuri Assyrians were. They were very direct, very straightforward. They've been accused of, and I don't know how much of this is mythology or not, they, they were accused of being very brutal. The prophet Jonah did not want to go and save Nineveh, Nineveh. Maybe they were, but they were direct. They weren't liars. They weren't slimy little snakes who slither around under false pretenses, false flags, proxy armies, and fake names. And I want to talk just a second about fake names. Now, take this with however many grains of salt that you need to. And I'm, I'm not absolutely, I'm not absolutely accusing, per se, right now, anyone. But I want to put some things out there. And at the same time, I, I would like you to be aware of something. And just ask yourself this. Is it not a good idea, if you want to be trusted, 
if you are a straight shooter, if you are honest, if you are who you say you are, and if you believe every word that you publicly espouse, would you not want to avoid at nearly any cost even the appearance of impropriety, the appearance of things not good, not quite right, you would kind of, you might not want to have images of yourself out there giving signs that are, are absolutely linked uh, and have been linked over and over and over and over again to uh, secret societies. You, you wouldn't want to have that stuff out there. You wouldn't want to be wearing around, um, you know, an orange jersey with 66 on it in a video. For no reason. You're not doing anything. You're looking at melons. But it just, that probably wouldn't be a great idea. Now, not everything... Um, for a long time, I stopped even going on camera. Not because I, I hate the way I look or because I'm inhibited by the camera, but because people will spend time reading into nearly anything. And if you talk with your hands, and I talk with my hands, if you listen to an audio that I do off camera, any of my audios, when I'm doing those audios, I'm speaking with my hands because I don't think I can truly, authentically, properly express myself without the facial gestures, the movements, the body movements, head movements I make, and the hand movements, the hand gestures I make. It's People who did make a big deal, for instance, this thing with Donald Trump where he would keep doing this, this, you know... I don't know how much that, that sign that's supposed to be okay, I don't know how many connections that has to anything occult. I mean, my goodness, when I was a kid, my dad taught me that this meant okay. <laughs> if things are good, this is how you can tell somebody. If they ask you, they're, you know, maybe they're 60, 80 feet away and they, hey, I'll, you see him on the streets. Everything okay? But now, suddenly, this, this, and this, they're all sixes. So, if you make that hand sign, and I don't know. I guess a lot of times you need to look at what context it's in. I think that would be smart. And it's good to look at what context a lot of these odd things we might see are in. You never want to look for one thing, I think, about somebody and you can say, bam, that seals the deal. They are, you want to look for three strong things about them that would lead you to believe something about them. Look for three strong things and then maybe more things below that, maybe weaker things. But two to three, two's all right. Three is very strong you know, so on and so forth. When I am suspicious of somebody out there, the first thing that will make me suspicious of them is what they teach. What they teach and how open they are to taking a serious look at an alternate viewpoint that has good evidence for it. A lot of guys out there, I shouldn't just say guys, there are women doing this too. People out there don't often do that. I guess some people could accuse me of that if, if they say, well, what about this or what about that? 
oftentimes the things that people suggest, there's two things. Either I've been over that ground before because where I am today, which is still, I'm, I'm still not somebody who can say, I've got things figured out, guys. I'm going to guide you through all of this. I can tell you exactly this and this and this and this. It's not the case. But I've been over a lot of ground to get to where I am. So I've reviewed a lot of things. There's a lot of things that I've looked into enough to be fairly convinced there's not a lot to it. And then there's things that the subject matter I've looked into maybe in another form, another place, another area, and there's not a lot to it. That's how it goes. But that's one thing I would usually look for. The other thing is they usually come right out. I mean, from the first time you even hear of them, they've got they've got a form and an outline to what they believe and what they teach. I mean, boom, they come out, boom, they've got a narrative down. Trace these people back, trace them back and see if you can find a time when they were developing beliefs. See if you can can spot a sort of progression in their development of beliefs. That's why I leave all of the old videos up. Like the old ones back, uh, you know, readings of Guide to Phantom Dark Age and, uh, and forward. Because I was developing beliefs, going from being an evangelical to like uh, a, a Protestant, you know, historicist Protestant, to a type of of white national identitarian to today none of the above simply just somebody who wants to know the truth of everything the truth of people the truth of yahweh god the truth of history the truth of who i am because i don't know for sure who i am if i tell you my name mactimus most likely comes from mictum which is an obri word and has a Greek suffix, which is not uncommon when you look at a lot of German words and names. They're, they're blended with what we call Greek. They're blended with what we call Latin. These languages are oftentimes freely admitted to all be from single source. They call it Proto-Indo-European. That doesn't prove that I am um, ethnically the same as other people from that geographical area. Most of, you know, the 23andMe information indicates mostly German and somewhat Gaul, Celtic, Irish, Scottish, okay, Celtic, Welsh, Anglo, lots of Anglos that are Celtic. Um, it doesn't prove anything. If I was not a, a, a son of Jacob Israel, I'd want to know that. I'd want to know that so I could adjust, so I could understand who it was. So I could be supportive of them seeing through their destiny. As according to everything that I believe from Scripture, I'd want to know that. It's the truth. I want to know the truth. And I appeal to people who want to know the truth. So let's just talk about the weirdness of um, pseudonyms, fake names, and terms. Terms that maybe don't need to be used that are used. One thing I'm going to highlight, I'm going to highlight two things kind of quickly because I'm already 23 minutes in. And I'm making these briefs as um, sort of um, companions to let's say posts. When I start getting back into uh, the books I have, I'll be making posts from those things. These are kind of like just companions. So I'm going to try to keep them short, okay? I'm going to highlight two things. One is the, uh, the name James. If I were to be operating under a pseudonym or a fake name, a pseudonym is a fake name, I would probably avoid James. Now, even some people can't, that's actually their name. Jim, James. They were born with the name James. Their parents gave them the name James. They can't do anything about that. That's true. But the last name. Now, if it can be proven that they're actually operating under a pseudonym and they picked 
the fake first name, James. That's interesting. And everybody out there who is a purported truth teller who operates under the name James, I think should be scrutinized for one reason, and actually there's numerous reasons. Uh, the name James and, uh, for instance, you go to the Wikipedia for Jacobin. Of course, it's not the greatest source you can find. It's the basic generic establishment source, but you're going to get a certain bit of truth, or at least basis of information that you can work from. So you go to the, um, the Wikipedia entry for Jacobin. This is important. Now you will see it's two other things not to be confused with Jacobin as a disambiguation or Jacobian or Jacobite, which is associated with not only the King James Steward of Scotland, but the language that was employed in the King James Version of the Bible, King's English, that language that we have today that, that, that are, um, this, this horrible bastard, uh, language English that we use today was based on. Okay, there's that. But this, these Jacobins, now you remember a few hundred years ago when supposedly the King James Bible was written, there, the J either didn't exist or was just coming into existence. His name would have more likely have been one of two things, either Haim, which is a variation of Ham as in Hamites, or uh, Jacob, or Jacob, not James. Um, either one of those terms could be used in some sort of way. These people use symbolic languages, symbolic names, symbolic numbers, so that they can communicate. They communicate with this. People know. People who are adept, they understand. They communicate like this. I would not use that name. And this is anybody who was born with that name, given it <laughs> by their parents, whether it's a, a surname or, or first name, Christian name, that's your name. I'm talking about people who adopt it as a fake name and the potential symbolism to it and why it should be avoided and why I can't understand why there's so many people out there who are operating under that pseudonym as a surname, why they wouldn't want to avoid that. These same people that I'm referring to have at least those three. I said that you, you should find at least three very disconcerting things about somebody, you know, before you start getting straight up suspicious about them. Now, all the people I'm talking about, there are, I've seen at least three big things that makes me concerned. So the Jacobins, according to Wikipedia, would um, they were uh, the society of, listen to this. Now, keep this in mind when you start running into people operating under pseudonyms with James in it. The Society of the Friends of the Constitution. French. Société des Amis de la Constitution. Renamed the Society of the Jacobins, Friends of Freedom and Equality. What are the cries of the revolutionists of Europe who were always tied in? We, we saw that in the book, um, Freemasonry and Judaism, Secret Powers Behind the Revolution. What, what are their cries? Liberty, Fraternity, Equality. Okay, the Jacobins, friends of freedom and equality, Societe uh, Jacobim, ami de la liberté et du la agalite. That's my French. Pretty good, right? After 1792, and commonly known as the Jacobin Club, it's a club, Club de Jacobin, or simply the Jacobins was the most influential political club during the French Revolution of 1789. The period of its political ascendancy includes the Reign of Terror. The Reign of Terror, during which time well over 10,000 people were put on trial and executed in France, many for political, political crimes. 
for those of you who have watched or or listened to, I hope you'd watched because it's the physical, the the visible uh, part of it, visual part of it. It's very important. Um, bringing it all together. There's always that uh, supposed liberator, the people's champion, and a great bloodbath that happens afterwards. And this great bloodbath is not per se uh, the horrible powers that were oppressing the people. That it always turns somehow to a group of people. And there's mass slaughter. It happened in the English Civil War, and then they turned on the Irish under Cromwell. It happened in the French Revolution, during and after the Revolution, and under the reign of Napoleon Bonaparte, hand in shirt, Cromwell, hand in shirt, and under Vladimir Lenin, hand in shirt, the hidden hand. Okay? All right. I'm not going to read a lot of this entry. You can. But there's enough here, and there is enough negative, um, there's enough negativity. And there's enough occult significance to that pseudonym or that name, if it's used as a pseudonym, James. Maybe even Jacob. Maybe even Ham, Chaim. But let's stick with James and Jacob. That I would avoid it. I'd really avoid it. Now, the other thing is the, um, the use of the term brother. If somebody goes by the term brother, or if they like to refer to certain individuals as brother, I avoid that. I've, I've avoided that for a heck of a long time. I've got one brother. That's it. I got one brother. And I don't even call him brother. I call him a lot of stuff. Trust me. But I don't, you know, typically call him brother. But that's the thing. I, I don't use that term. I don't use that term on other people, but there are people who they specifically use that term. Now, it, it, it has become a really common term, like especially in evangelical churches, you know, brother this and sister that and, and all that. Um, yeah. But people who stylize themselves as brother. There's a guy on YouTube who his whole bag is to disprove the Trinity. He, I think his channel used to be called the Trinity Delusion. That's his whole thing. All New Testament, pretty much. You know, a little bit of the Old Testament. But what he does, what I find so troubling, and so many people do, is they seem like they're offering you something very fresh, like cutting right to the heart of truth. But they're oftentimes arguing from flawed foundations. He is continually arguing from English translations of Koine Greek, both languages, uh, not very trustworthy organic languages at all. And so there's a lot of questions concerning his foundations that he doesn't address. Now, he used to be called the Trinity Delusion, but then changed it to Brother Kel. And I've had a few interactions with him years ago, and he he's certainly doesn't strike me as someone who gives a rat's ass about people. There's, there's a number of people that go by that title, aren't there? brother. Mm. I would be concerned. The reason I would be concerned is because this term, brother, it goes to clubs, which we just saw with the Jacobin clubs, fraternal organizations, in particular Masons, um, Templars, Hospitallers, fraternities, Today, Freemasons use that term commonly to refer to another Mason specifically, brother. We can see with the Knights Hospitallers, which um, also this Order of St. John, which is a whole interesting topic in and of itself. Um, you, you might have noticed this um, 
that that little quip that I put near the God, when I referred to the Gospel of John as Yun in the uh, bringing it all together. But uh, for instance, they they say in this uh, this Wikipedia on the Knights Hospitallers, the order numbered three distinct classes of membership: the military brothers, the brothers in Fremarians, and the brothers chaplains chaplains any one of these orders clubs um, that is specifically a term used specifically within those societies clubs fraternities to refer to a member it's used to this day um, with college fraternities which really college fraternities are just a, a sort of localized microcosm of these larger societies most societies being secret to one degree or another I wouldn't use the term I would avoid that term and when you start seeing people that are using pseudonyms that yeah and then they're ignoring a lot of things that you wonder why are they ignoring that why why won't they even explore that you start building up these clues as to are they are they really genuine hmm so there's the idea of brother there's the oddity of let's say people who use 3 initial names or that make it their logo when you see something like I've I've checked around on Andrew Carrington Hitchcock and nobody can seem to tell me exactly what his if that is his real name and if it's provable I don't know I nobody seems to have the answer but I can tell you that when you put those initials together a C H ACH is the uh, phonetic transliteration of the Masoretic Hebrew pronunciation of brother. Ach. 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 Brother. Brother. I would avoid that in your pseudonym if you wanted to avoid even the appearance of impropriety and with that I'm gonna wrap it because I know I'm at 3750 but I had a lot to say today so I'll see you guys next time lots to think about take care